Thank you for that kind and generous introduction, Mel. Um, I should also thank my husband, uh, who's somewhere in the audience, because he actually brought my ring, which I forgot, which I think speaks to the fact that I am so newly married. Um, <laughs> but on behalf of the First Lady, uh, it is my honor to be here at the Innovation Summit, so thank you for having me. I wanted to start by telling you a story about a girl whose family was seeking to leave um, a civil war. Her parents tried everything to try to get to America, but the only country that they could actually seek harbor in was Nigeria. Her parents were both teachers, and they knew the importance of education. And so they knew of America as the promised land, a place where through education and hard work, their daughter could achieve anything that she dreamt of. By stark contrast, they also knew that in parts of Nigeria, less than half of the girls were enrolled in secondary school. And they knew that all over the country, over five million girls were out of school. Of course, what they didn't know was that in northern Nigeria, where they were planning to live, over 200 girls would be targeted and ultimately kidnapped by Boko Haram just because they were trying to get an education. Tragically, these statistics and these barriers are not unique to Nigeria. In fact, less than one-third of girls in sub-Saharan Africa and less than one-half of girls in South Asia are currently enrolled in secondary school. In Somalia, 95% of girls are currently not in school. And these numbers add up. Across the world, over 62 million girls are out of school today. And what breaks my heart is the fact that none of this is by accident, and all of it is preventable. The barriers that keep girls out of school are both big and small, pervasive and persistent. Everything from extreme poverty, where parents can't even pay small school fees, to the fact that some girls are forced into early child marriages, to the fact that some schools don't have girls' bathrooms. And so when girls try to go to the local, middle, or high school, they have no ability to even use a toilet. To address these barriers, the President and First Lady launched Let Girls Learn last March, March of 2015, in order to support the 62 million girls who should be in school, but are not. Because we know that by investing in these girls, by giving them an education, there are no limits to what they can achieve and the impact they can have. We know, for example, that educated girls are able to raise healthier families. A Lancet study, for example, has shown that increase in girls' education was responsible for more than half the reduction in child morbidity and mortality that was experienced between 1970 and 2009. We know that educated girls earn higher incomes. And what's striking is how significant the impact is. For each additional year of secondary school, a girl's earning potential increases by 15 to 25%. And we know that more girls in school can boost a country's entire economy, which is why economists like Larry Summers have concluded the girls' education is the single highest return investment we can make in the developing world. And girls who become leaders in their communities and their countries take on issues ranging from public health to the environment to issues related to conflict and war. And yet, even knowing all of these benefits and so many more, we still aren't able to guarantee girls an education. And so that's why the administration launched Let Girls Learn in order to advance adolescent girls' education through a, for a few key areas. So first let me talk about our governmental engagement and diplomatic engagement. The U.S. government has been increasing our funding for adolescent girls' education just as we've been increasing our support for adolescent girls' programming. We've partnered with countries like the U.K., Japan, Pakistan, South Korea, just to name a few examples, in order to create a global coalition around girls' education. 
We've worked with multilateral organizations like the World Bank, and just this April, during the spring meetings, we worked in collaboration with them to announce a new $2.5 billion in support of adolescent girls' education over the next five years. But we realize that even building an international coalition of governments isn't going to solve the problem, because the reality is that you can't address 62 million girls out of school worldwide through a top-down approach. And so a second key area that we've been focusing on are community-based approaches, because we have to work with communities and countries to identify the key barriers to girls' education and then empower them to implement solutions that are tailored and can effectively solve them. And that's why public-private partnerships have been a key part of the initiative. So we've partnered with IBM, Johnson & Johnson, JetBlue, Procter & Gamble, Land's End, Barney's, foundations like UPS and Xerox foundations, even academic universities like Georgetown and Cambridge. Because we know that each of these companies and institutions, and many of those in the audience today, are already working to critically fight for women and girls. And so we have wanted to partner with them in order to advance the collective cause. Finally, we've been working to engage a broader audience in order to increase awareness and to get individuals to take action. And so last September, we launched our hashtag 62 million girls campaign at the Global Citizen Festival. Just as in March at South by Southwest, we partnered with change.org in order to create a pledge so that individuals can take action. Obviously, we've done a lot in the past year, and I'm excited to announce that in the past year, while we have made important strides, the best, I believe, is really yet to come. And so during the remainder of this administration, and frankly, well beyond, you will see the First Lady and the President continuing to engage on global girls' education. So you may ask, why am I so personally passionate about girls' education? Because that story that I told you at the start of this talk about the girl and her family, that's my story. Just as my family was about to leave Sri Lanka for Nigeria, my parents got their green cards to come to America. And so I had the opportunity to go to Yale and Oxford and Yale Law School, and now to work with the First Lady. And that's why I'm here today. And that's why I'm here to ask for your help. Because every girl around the globe, regardless of where she was born, deserves a quality education. And that's why I'm here to ask for your help today. Because you represent and lead corporations and small businesses and foundations that are transforming industries and fields. You lead organizations and movements that are changing people's lives. And by your examples and how you've chosen to invest your time and money You've shown fidelity to the fundamental principle that a girl's ability to achieve her dreams should only be limited by her imagination. We know that girls' education is the best investment we can make, not just in their futures, but in the future of their families, their communities, and countries. And that's why it's our responsibility as leaders as philanthropists, as citizens of this country and our world to help let girls learn. Thank you.